So you can see that here, if your room temperature is too hot, too much, too hot, then the, the sensor of the thermostat can send it, can sense it, then uh, you send that okay, the temperature is too high or higher than the 68 degree Fahrenheit set point, then you turn off the furnace so that you let the room temperature to cool down back to the 68 degree Fahrenheit. But if, if, if the furnace turn off for too long, the room temperature cool down for too much, then what will happen? The, you, the, the, the room temperature may drop to 66 degree Fahrenheit, which is too cold, too low for the set point. Then the sensor can sense it, and then the control center will tell the furnace to turn on to raise the room temperature so that you will restore to 68 degree uh, Fahrenheit. But if the furnace turn on for too long, the temperature may go up to, let's say, 70 degree Fahrenheit too hot. Then um, you will, so basically you can see that you will just keep going, going, going on and on. In other words, your room temperature is set approximately around 68 degree Fahrenheit, but it is actually fluctuating between 66 to 70 degree Fahrenheit. So it is maintaining in a dynamic uh, range, but the average is 68. So the homeostasis is not a constant flat line of 68 degree Fahrenheit. It is a fluctuation between 66 and 70 degree Fahrenheit. Similarly, how, how does our body maintain uh, homeostasis? We are our body maintain the body temperature by by negative feedback as well. The control center is our brain. Specifically in the brain, we have a circuit called hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is the control center for the body temperature. And of course, we set our body temperature at 37 degrees Celsius, and the control center can the hypothalamus can control the blood vessels near the skin to dilate. If our body temperature is too hot, that means maybe the, uh, it is in a hot summer day, um, our body temperature is uh, too hot because the summer temperature is too high, then we will dilate the blood vessel near the skin so that it will increase blood flow near the skin, the body surface so that um, we will allow more heat to dissipate to the surrounding, to the air. Sweat gland will also um, uh, activated by the nervous system to produce more sweat so that the evaporation of the sweat on the skin surface will lower the temperature. On the other hand, in winter time, if our body temperature falls below the normal 37 degrees Celsius, Hypothalamus will also cause the blood vessels near the skin to constrict. We call this the vasoconstriction. This will reduce blood flow to the surface of the skin and it will reduce uh, heat dissipation to the surrounding environment. And then if the body temperature falls even uh, lower, then what will happen? Nervous system will send signal to your skeletal muscle and it will cause rapid contraction of your skeletal muscle we call it shivering shivering is basically a rapid contraction of your skeletal muscle and then you, when you contract your muscle it uses energy it uses ATP remember when we break down ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate it will release energy Part of the energy releases will give your body energy to do the action that you want to do, but most of, uh, but some of the energy will be dissipated as a heat. The heat that is dissipated will keep our body warm, and it will restore our body temperature back to the 37 degrees Celsius. So the negative feedback prevents changes in the same. Uh, it's like the same way of the hemp. Uh, Thermostat, uh, thermostat. So you can see that if your body temperature is too hot, 
Then your um, hypothalamus will sense it, and then go back to your 98.6 de degree, and then you have all these effects, uh, blood vessel dilate, sweat gland secret sweat, and then lower your body temperature. If your if uh, body room is too low, then what will happen? Hypothalamus can detect the drop of the body temperature, and then um, your brain will cause like a vasoconstriction, constriction, uh, decrease the diameter of your blood vessels, um, sweat gland will be inactive, and your skeletal muscle will start to contract, causing shivering, uh, uh, releasing more ATP energy to raise the body temperature back to the normal body temperature, 98.6 Fahrenheit, degree Fahrenheit. We have negative feedback, we also have positive feedback. Uh, in this course, we will only give you two examples of positive feedback. The first one is blood clotting. Blood clotting is uh, an example of positive feedback. When we have an open wound, then platelet cells start to uh, accumulate or aggregate, accumulate, accumulate at the opening of the wound. The more Cell you, you gather at the open wound, the more planar cell you attract there. So the, it is an exponential increase of the planar cell at the opening wound. And then also you will have uh, another example is the childbirth. When women are giving birth, the contraction of the uterus will become stronger and stronger. This is what we call positive feedback. Positive feedback is like you are rolling a snowboard down a mountain hill, down a hill, uh, down a slope, as the, the snowball will get bigger and bigger. So this blood clotting and the contraction of the uterus, contraction of the uterus will be stronger and stronger. Accumulation of platelet cell will, will, you have more and more platelet cell accumulated there. Until when? Until the wound is completely uh, plugged, until the baby comes out. Then you will stop this positive feedback. Now we will briefly talk about each system, surgeon system. For example, the cardiovascular system, they transport blood. Um, they, they transport blood. The blood cell, red blood cell, they carry the gases. Um, the blood plasma, carry uh, nutrients like glucose and amino acid and also metabolic waste like urea, ammonia and uric acid and tissue fluid um, let me the lymph um, tissue fluid, in this case we call it extracellular fluid Extracellular fluid, they are the fluid that bathes the cell of the body. So what happens is that the uh, oxygen nutrient carried by the blood, they will diffuse, they will go into, they will diffuse into the extracellular fluid. And then from extracellular fluid, they will diffuse, they will or absorb into your body tissue cells. And then the metabolic waste and the carbon dioxide produced from your uh, body tissue cell, they will be, um, they will go into your extracellular fluid, the tissue fluid, and then from the tissue fluid, they will go into your blood. So that you will carry by, your, by the blood to go to your lung for gaseous exchange, or metabolic waste will, will be carried by the blood to go into kidneys so that your kidney can get rid of all this metabolic waste so this is what I mean in here, you have the blood vessels here and then you see this white space, the white space here they are filled with the so called tissue fluid or extracellular, uh, extracellular fluid and then these are the tissue cell, tissue cell can be your muscle cell and then uh, this is what it means, the oxygen and nutrient will go into the 
extra cellular fluid first, and then from the extra cellular fluid, you go into the cell. And then the carbon dioxide and metabolic waste produced by the uh, tissue cell, they will go into your extracellular fluid first, and then you go into your blood. And then your respiratory system, it is basically telling you uh, now how the transport system is your cardiovascular system, mainly your cardiovascular system. Actually, your lymphatic system is also a transportation system, but we didn't talk about this. Then the maintenance systems, we have the respiratory system. That means your lung that exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then your digestive system, um, they take in the digestive food to provide nutrients. They break down the food that you eat and then absorb it to your body so that you can provide nutrients, glucose and amino acid for your body cell to use. And then liver, another organ that helps your digestive system, they regulate blood composition, remove toxin, make urea. Um, your liver, remove toxin, they also um, um, help, they also help to break down your own red blood cell after 120 days. Um, they also have to make urea. They break down protein, excess protein will be broken down and to form urea in the liver. And the kidneys, they also part of the maintenance system because they regulate blood volume salt balance and pH regulation and waste of removal. These four are the major function of kidney. They are very important. In other words, your kidney actually helps your cardiovascular system. Your kidney helps cardiovascular vascular system. And then we have supportive systems. The support system are the integumentary, your skin, your muscle, and your skeletal system. Skeletal system, they protect internal organ muscle. They have to move, and also they have to protect your internal organ. Basically, all these three, they can protect your internal organ. Uh, Integumentary system, they make vitamin D, which is uh, essential for your skeletal system. Your skeletal system stores mineral, namely calcium, uh, produces red blood cell from the red bone marrow and your skeletal system stores body fat in the yellow bone marrow and then um, vitamin D produced by your skin vitamin D helps the absorption of calcium in your GI tract so that uh, the calcium can be used to uh, build your skeletal system to build the bone And then control system. Control system, the major one is your nervous system. Nervous system and the endocrine system, there are two uh, control systems, but the major one is the nervous system. Nervous system basically control the endocrine system. And that's why if you take physiology, usually the first system that we talk about is the nervous system so that you understand how our brain controls other systems. And yes, your nervous system controls the muscle so that you can have uh, immediate motor response. And endocrine system controls endocrine gland that secrete hormones. Hormone takes a longer time to bring out the action. Nervous system is very fast and immediate. Diseases, 